Hi, thanks very much. So I'm going to talk about uh, PI416937. So what's that? It's one of thousands of USDA um, soybean lines that are in the public domain. And this one, it, its origin um, is from a land race in Japan, probably growing on the berms of, of a paddy, not from a particularly drought area, but when planted out in fields in North Carolina several decades ago, it jumped out. It's, it's called what a, a slow wilter. So when, the, when water is limiting in the soil, this plant wilts a couple days later. Okay, this is a pretty useful trait. Drought is the most important limitation on crop production. And until recently, there are no commercially available drought um, addressing seed supplies in, in the US. Okay, but the problem was, this has been, it's in the public domain. It's been there for decades and it, the soybean breeders, of course, they knew about this. They knew it was important, but they didn't know how to make use of it because they got inconsistent results when they did breeding and planting it out. So we came in with a competitive grant from the USDA of, in about 2006 to work in collaboration with USDA scientists to try to figure out what is the physiological basis of this trait, of this behavior, and, and how to make use of it. Now, let me say something about, you know, conservative water use, because now we call it the plant water conservation or water um, trait rather than a delayed wilting, it, it, they will impact yield. And this is part of the reason why you, know, um, under, it, you get these variable results because the, you know, using water more slowly means you're getting in CO2 more slowly, you're growing more slowly. And so that's one reason. And the second reason is that um, drought is many things. It manifests in many ways depending on the developmental stage and when it occurs. So, you know, this is what these experiments look like. This is from our project. It was multiple years. The first year we planted up near the Raleigh-Durham area, clay soils, lots of rain that year, no drought. Second year we moved to these deep sandy soils in the sand ridges in North Carolina, the Sand Hills research data, too dry. We had a terrible year. We, you know, everything did poorly. The Goldilocks story, in our third year, we did pretty well. We got, you know, enough drought, not too much. Here are the collaborators, Tom Sinclair, USDA ARS scientist, my master's thesis advisor, and Tommy Carter, probably the preeminent soybean breeder in the US. And here's the Harvard crew. We managed to go down there and pretend we were agriculturalists out in the field. But, but we didn't waste the first three years of this, of this grant because we were working hard in the lab to understand the basis of this behavior, this phenotype, so that we could help then the breeders try to pinpoint its way, because you've got to bring these traits then back into high yielding lines that are resistant to pesticides. So what we found, and, and so I thought was really interesting was, um, I don't know where the pointer is on this, but anyway, is that the, um, when we compared our PI, this is our slow wilter, that's just another, you know, reasonable yielding of similar age soybean line. So like a typical crop plant, as we increase what's called the vapor pressure difference, so that's the driving gradient. You can think of that as the humidity going down, the driving gradient for evaporation out of the leaves through these stomata that the plants, these holes that they get all their CO2. The, the typical crop plant just keeps on, you know, keeps its stomata open, the water just keeps piling out. And, but in these conservative plants, when the, when the humidity got too low, then they shut their stomata. Now, as a, a student of wild plants, this is exactly what I expected plants to do. It seemed perfectly reasonable. You wouldn't overinvest in water transport capacity, but throttle back. But the, uh, my colleague, Tom Sinclair, who was here at Harvard on sabbatical, he was shocked. He's like, crops don't do this. This is what crops do. So we had this sort of cross of cultures there from the sort of bio evolutionary biologists and the agronomists, but this was really useful for water conserving trait because these guys are throttling back their somata at the time when they are least efficient in the diffusional uptake of CO2 at versus water loss. So they just cut back then and they leave water in the soil. Now a wild plant would never do that. Leaving water in the soil is useless because your neighbor takes it, but in a cropping situation it can lead to more transpiration for more days delayed wilting. And that's in fact what these plants do. So but now we had some understanding of the trait. When we went a step further, now this is some, a little bit more complicated uh, stuff we do in the lab to try to understand the hydraulic basis of plants and basically we put grow them in these these root pressure chambers and we can override the hydraulic effects of transpiration and soil drying. We can basically null out uh, the effects of, of that and we can try to, we wanted to see where in the plant it was sort of responding to this 
higher transpirational demand. And what we found, it was not in the xylem at all, though, the water transporting tubes, but downstream. So what's downstream in the plant? It's in the leaf on the far end of the veins before you get to where you where they evaporate. So so like I'm a you know I'm an acad I'm you know truly an academic, right? I study the microhydrology of how water moves around in plants and heat and evaporation in leaves. But this was really helpful because this now gives us a way to develop screens for this trait that don't involve growing plants out over you know huge fields. You can't do drought experiments in pots and growth chambers. It just, it, it's useless. And so now we knew something more about these plants, and it's been very helpful. So first of all, we've been able to, as we understand the behavior, we can simulate the yield response over in, uh, with a good soybean physiology model and, and weather data for 50 years. And if you just look at panel A, you'll see the fraction of years in which this water conservation trait, this sort of conservative behavior at high demand, um, resulted in a yield increase. It's really, you know, it's not huge, but it, it, it is an effect. And then we've also provided now tools for um, putting this, this, this trait into um, high yielding backgrounds and the seed distribution. I mean, this stuff is now out there. And I'll just close, well, you know, this is just off the web. You know, here's from Pioneer and DuPont there, Aquamax. So now they're moving this trait, they're looking for this trait in other species. And of course they're finding it, right? And I just have this here, I, I circle that advanced still model control because it's not advanced. So with, with breeding for high yielding crops, we got rid of this more conservative behavior that is you know, inherent in, in, in natural populations and natural selection leads to that. And we got rid of it for breeding for high yields under um, agronomic situations. And now when we're sort of thinking about um, the agricultural footprint and yields under other situations, we find that this sort of throttling back um, has some some value and you can see that under you know under some circumstances you get to lower yield under certain rainfall you get lower yield with this trait but if you average over you know the the range of conditions that a farmer is going to face this can be very helpful so I'll end there